Welcome to the second part of our great confession. How many of you enjoyed last Sunday? Awesome. Amen. Uh, for those of you who were not here last Sunday, in a summary, uh, we talked about how Christianity was once called the great confession. Hebrews 3 verse 1 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, even Jesus. And the word... Um, to hold fast means to stay fully committed to the word our confession means uh, to confess, to speak the same words, to say the same thing. So we hold fast to saying the same thing over and over again. I hope your confession didn't change through, the, through last week. <laughs> you know, I woke up one morning and I was really feeling uh, just suffering from lack of sleep. And I had to do a lot that day. And then the Lord reminded me, son, you need to hold fast to your confession. And I began to declare, Lord, I receive strength today. I thank you that you have supplied every grace I need for today. Believe it or not, grace came. And sleep depri deprivation can be one of the simple things that we struggle with. And I felt the Lord telling me, he says, you know, my son, if you can't see me in the little things, you can experience me in the big things. You're not going to see the Lord part the Red Sea. You're not going to see the Lord raise the dead. You're not going to see the Lord supernaturally transform your finances if you can't see him change your mood. In the midweek service, well, for some time now, I've been talking about mood swings. One of the key verses there has been Ephesians 4, 23. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Sorry to say this, sometimes we can have rotten attitudes. And the Holy Spirit, who is so gentle, in fact, you, just think of any gentleman you know. They're not even half as gentle as the Holy Spirit. He's knocking. And the Bible says, if anyone hears his voice and opens the door, if I come to your house and knock, you will not open. You, um, you will not open the door until you're convinced, oh, it's a familiar face, why come in peace? One of the reasons why we don't open the door and let God renew our thoughts and attitudes, one, we don't even know that he can. We don't even know he comes in peace. We don't even know that his plans for us are plans of good. And that you might as well just let him because if, if you don't let him, you're going to learn the hard way. So you might as well learn the good way. <laughs> Can we, and that's the root of sin, not trusting God. The word sin means to miss the mark. Let God renew your thoughts and attitudes. So let us hold fast to our confession. That's a good summary today. I want to continue, and I really just want to expound on the culture of heaven. You see, heaven is all about words. And even God himself did not create or did not create, or will not create without words. Right from John 1, 1 to 4, it says, In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So you see that? Heaven is all about a Word, which is Jesus. He existed in the beginning with God. What makes heaven heaven is the Word. And the next verse says, God created everything through Him. Who? Jesus. Who is what? The Word. And nothing was created except through Him. And guys, this is the very verse, John 1, 4, that this church was founded on. The Word gave life to everything that was created. And His life brought light to everyone. Wow. That word light also means fire, just so you know. His word gave life to everything that was created. Do you know that everything that my wife and I have been blessed with, okay, let me not go into the details like a t-shirt or, but every major material thing has come through our great confession. It says, God created everything through him. And nothing was created th except through him. The word, the confession, gave life to everything. 
Wow. I shared last week, I said, every job that Melody has had since I've known her, since I met her in 2013, came forth from our great confession. Her very identity came through this great confession. She had wanted to study something else. I says, I see, I sense God has called you to be a teacher. Today, she's a teacher and an awesome teacher at that. And it dawned on me that every job, too, I've had came out of a great confession. In fact, on the flip side, my job came out of Melody's great confession. When she came to get her wedding gown, she met this bishop of the organization that I was pastoring in, and she took his card. And she began to de decree and confess because the associate pastor had just left that church, and she began to call for that job for me. So I went there with a sense of expectation. And the more I spoke it, and I'm going to break that down on why or how to confess today. And the more I began to speak this, the Lord began to speak to me. He says, I've called, when, when you get there, you're going to be the associate pastor, the youth pastor, or both. Sometimes God speaks in parables. And to cut the long story short, I got there and I became the family pastor, the associate pastor in charge of family ministries, overseeing youth and children. God is true to his word. Wow. Supposing life was all about living by our great confession, that we can begin to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to that power, according to that confession. Because remember, faith is believing and speaking, 2 Corinthians 4.13. To understand this great confession, you need a paradigm shift. You see, we're wired to think that our actions and efforts make us prosper before our prayers. But heaven says that your prayers precedes your performance. And we see that in Isaiah 55, 8 to 11. I'm not saying anybody needs to perform in Christ, but I'm talking about your actions. Isaiah 55, 8 to 11 says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. Verse 11. It is the same with my word. Everything God was saying in this chapter, he was contrasting to his word. I send it out. And it always, somebody say always, produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to. And it will prosper everywhere I send it. Guys, that's the key. It will prosper everywhere God sends it. So I've really talked about the great confession, the power of, of positive speaking and speaking faith, but today I really want to emphasize on God's way. You see, he says, it will prosper everywhere I send it, not where you send it. You don't have the ability to just speak a word, name it and claim it, and that word not come out of the will of God. Faith comes by what? Hearing. We always forget that part. Faith comes out of a relationship. So I'm really trying to balance this word of faith that I believe in. And I believe you can have what you say. I'm a living testimony to that. I called forth my wife. God spoke to me. I will bring her from the ends of the earth. And I will bring her to a place I have chosen for your dwelling. I stood on that word. I confessed it. God brought her from the United States to my neighborhood. 
If that's not a great confession, I don't know what is. Wow. God's way. God's way is that he believes something inside of himself and then he speaks it out of the fullness of his character. John 1.16 says, out of his fullness, we have all received one blessing after blessing. That's amplified. Gift after gift. Favor after favor. Out of his fullness. Guys, your confession has to come from the fullness of your relationship with God. It has to come out of the revelation of who God is. It is not you performing for yourself or trying to claim something. It is you just responding to the grace of God. And as you encounter, I've been taking you guys through this journey on prosperity God's way because I'm growing in my revelation of Jehovah Jireh. And as from the, from the moment I decreed, we're going to start this series. Did you notice us prospering? Did you notice your pastor prospering? Yes, I started growing. As I was studying, God says, not by chance that I blessed you just before this series because you confessed. We're, we've entered a season of prosperity. And as we hear his word, we're going to begin to prosper. I believe it's the Lord putting this on my heart and leading us in this direction that we need to grow in this understanding that it gives him great pleasure to give you the kingdom. And I began to declare some some, some amazing things as the Lord had put in my heart and we saw the manifestation even in my life. How much more your life. You can have what you say when you pray God's way. God's way. To know God's thoughts in every situation is what we call Rima. We talked about this last week. That quickened word. In this verse, in uh, Matthew 26, 75, Peter remembered the word of Jesus. That word, word in that verse is the word rima. It literally means a spoken word, an utterance, a saying, but specifically a spoken word appropriate for the situation. It means a series of words joined together into a sentence, a declaration of one's mind made in words. So just because you are a Christian, it doesn't mean you know his thoughts concerning every situation. It takes a reamer quickened word. It takes a revelation through God's spirit because the, the Bible says the letter killeth. So you can go to Bible school and still not know God's will for your life. But the spirit gives life. 1 Corinthians 8 tells us that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. I'm talking about an experience through a relationship with Jesus. Some people have just filled themselves up or their heads up with too much knowledge and they lack this experiential knowledge that comes simply from just knowing Jesus loves you and he's got you and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Childlike faith that we can ask in respect like my son, I need some food, dad. I'm hungry, dad. Please feed me, dad. And we have this boldness, this confidence. The Bible says that we know that whatever we ask him, in accordance to his will, it gives him great pleasure. Wow. Romans 12, 2, the Passion Translation says, Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. The safest place to be is in the perfect will of God. I've just been feeling so safe, so secure the past couple of months. Not that I've not being feeling secure prior to that, but there's just this overwhelming sense of safety that God's got me. God's got me. I can see clearly. 
one of my favorite quotes, or probably my favorite quote, is by George W. Truett. It says, knowing the will of God is the greatest knowledge. To find the will of God is the greatest discovery. To do the will of God is the greatest achievement. So in other words, I'm really not trying to lead you to prosperity. I'm trying to lead you to Jesus, who came to do the will of his Father. I'm trying to lead you to Jesus because he's the way, the truth, and the life. And when you begin to encounter Jesus for yourself, you will begin to know God's will for you in every situation. You will have the needed revelation, illumination to know and to recognize if this word is from God. As it said in John 7, you can know the thoughts of God, but it comes through the presence of God, the peace of God. Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, He will keep in perfect peace he whose mind is stayed on him. That word peace there is the word shalom. Shalom, it means completeness, safety, soundness in mind and body, welfare, peace, health, quiet, tranquility, contentment, friendship, and prosperity. See, guys, that's so key. It means contentment. You see, the only reason why people are not walking in perfect peace is because they do not put their complete trust in God. There's an overwhelming sense of contentment that comes when you know you're in God's perfect will. Apostle Paul says, I found the secret of being content. Whether I be in plenty, whether I be in little. There's a secret. And this secret comes in John 25, verse 14. It says, the secret of the sweet, satisfying companionship have they who fear, who revere the Lord, and he will show to them its deep inner meaning, the covenant. Wow. This is what I'm talking about. I'm not necessarily talking about money, cars, material things, even though that's a byproduct of coming into the will of God because his plans for you are plans of good and he's a good father. I'm talking about this strong sense, this well-being, that the path of the righteous is a bright light, shining brighter and brighter to a perfect day. But it comes by hearing that quickened word. When you're going through crisis, when you see your finances depleting, and then through the meditation of God's word, because Second Peter 1, 2 says, grace and peace be multiplied through the knowledge of Christ Jesus. So it's not just, oh, I claim that word. You got to do the, you got to do your own work. You got to study to show thyself approved. And, and it is through that revelation ooh, that you can just, in that situation, I'm speaking from experience. Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That word want means decrease. When I, when I came into that understanding, that was it. I don't care whether I'm a businessman. I don't care whether I'm skilled in watching the stock market. Not that I've ever done that. I'm just speaking. <laughs> you behave yourself, account. You shall not decrease. I command you in the name of Jesus to come back to your original state. Melody, is it working? Amen. It's working. From zero, zero, several times, guys. I shared the testimony last week. Not once, not twice, not three times. I'm telling you, it has happened to us. When we relocated from Nigeria, we emptied our account. And as we were doing that, an overwhelming sense of fear just came upon, okay, you can never maintain your home. When you come back, you're going to be broke. And I just remembered that's another way we get a revelation, through remembrance. The Bible says in the book of Peter, we should stare ourselves up through remembrance. And I remember the vision God gave me where I saw our two accounts, my personal and our joint, growing by the grace of God. And I remembered, wait a minute. 
It wasn't even my, my skill, my charisma, or my education that, that blessed this account in the first place. And as I remembered that, I began to speak to that account. As I was still praying, that account received an alert. The second account received an alert. True story, guys. 2015, since that day till today, that account has been self-sustaining. When I, and, I'm, and I hold back from sharing the things that God uses me to do in that because my Nigerian friends would be calling me on a dime. But to the glory of God, I just use that to bless others. Wow. God's way. He says, my word will prosper everywhere I send it. God's way says, you speak a word and it shall be established. God's way says, you speak before you work. But you see the culture we've come into? You're laboring. Do you know that, do you know that labor was as a result of the curse? And the consequences, he told Adam, says you will always labor. Now, I'm not against hard work. Oh, the first instruction God gave me was, you need to work hard. But we labor to enter his rest. We make an effort, that's what the word labor means, to make due diligence. We labor to enter his rest, into his favor. So we begin to see that we're prospering through favor and less labor. And even if we're now laboring, we're laboring in our specific assignment where you're doing what God has called you to do and you're not doing it from a place of rest. If I was trying to be a teacher today, maybe I'll be laboring. But God has called me to, do, to be a pastor and even in my sleep I preach. You see, part of the favor is hearing God, being and doing what God has called you to do. You can apply this to relationship. Once you get into relationship with the wrong person, you'll be laboring for the rest of your life. Instead of resting a good relationship, you should be enjoying and not enduring. And that's why prosperity happens in God's perfect will. I'm not saying that you can't be blessed outside of that, but I broke this down in some series before, that, the, that God's way, the Bible says that an inheritance gained quickly in the beginning at the end will not be blessed. God's way sometimes is, is the slow way, is the gradual way. Let perseverance finish its work before you're mature and complete, lacking nothing, so that you'll be mature and complete, lacking nothing. God's way says the blessings of God make rich and add no sorrow. And we've seen a lot of people who just say, you know what? I'm just going to sell my soul and make a quick buck in Hollywood and in business and in a credit card scam and whatever they're doing today. But you know what? It comes with sorrow. One of my favorite celebrities, I won't mention him, his name, but you can put two and two together. I grew up watching his um, sitcoms. And I just told Melody yesterday, he just, he just broke up with his beautiful bride. This guy was once on Time magazine the most uh, exceptional uh, gentleman. And I, I used to tell Melody, because I'd seen it in dreams, God shows me a lot of things about celebrities so I can learn the difference between God's way and the world's way. And I always tell, tell Melody, I says, it's going to come around and kick this guy in the behind one day because he's cheating on his spouse. It's happened. Wow. A renewed mind guys, is empowered to trust God. A renewed mind naturally wants to trust God. But an unrenewed mind naturally wants to doubt God. That's why the greatest blessing, Solomon was the richest man in the world. His name means peace. And the Bible says God gave him wisdom. God brought his name into fruition. When you have the peace, I already got it. When you have the peace, I'm already blessed with everything I need pertaining to life and godliness. When you have the peace, I'm already seated with him in heavenly places. When you have the peace that his plans for me are plans of good. When you have the peace that there's no evil in God so that when you find yourself in a 
challenging situation and the devil begins to tell you, oh, this is because of your, your actions and God is punishing you, God does not punish with evil. The Bible says, let no man say God is tempting him, for God does not tempt, him, tempt anybody. When you on that, when the peace, this is who God is. I'm blessed. He loves me unconditionally. That, re, that transformation literally activates something in your soul that begins to cause you to hear God better and to trust his leading. You are wired to hear God's voice. And in fact, it becomes a problem when you're not hearing God's voice. And part of the problem is that we have not been completely made whole through the word renewing of our mind. Um, Psalm, Psalm 19 verse 7 says the testimony of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. It means to turn back to its original state. That state in which God created Adam in the beginning. Where he just knew he was created in God's image. Right from the Old Testament, this is a prophecy concerning us as Christians. Ezekiel 36, 26, 27. And I will give you a new heart. I'm speaking to somebody today. Somebody struggling with a bad heart. Somebody struggling with a, with, with a bad mind, because sometimes hearts are a metaphor for minds in the Bible. And I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out of your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. Did you see any part in that prophecy, in that promise, that you will be the one changing yourself? Let God renew your thoughts and attitudes. As we say, let go and let God. People have not fully understood. There's, a, there's an old hymn that says, perfect submission. All is at rest. I and my Savior, happy and blessed. I could give God my 401k. Like, like, like Abraham, sacrifice your son. I know that sounds a bit morbid, but he gave him his son, knowing that he could also resurrect his son back to life. So Lord, take it. I know that you're a God who gives and multiplies when we give to you. I can trust you with my tithes, regardless of how much I get. Because I know that God can do more with my 90% than I can do with my 100%. It's all a trust issue. And then in the New Testament, the writer of Hebrews reiterates the prophecy again in Hebrews 8, 10 to 11. But this is the new covenant. And that's what we have as Christians in the New Testament, born-again Christians. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel. On that day, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. They will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord for everyone. Somebody say everyone. Everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already. It says you are now a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. The biggest challenge is that we have not fully understood who we are in Christ Jesus. We still have not yet gone through this conversion, so our spirit has not yet been affirmed by God's spirit that we are children of God. We're still looking at our circumstances. We're still looking at our past, and condemnation is still telling you, you don't have the capacity to hear God's voice. You don't have the authority to speak and call forth what was not as though it were. Who are you to rebuke depression? Who are you to speak and call forth finances when you still struggle with porn? You see, it has nothing to do with you. 
You're speaking out of the fullness of who God is in your spirit. That on that cross, he paid the price in full. And therefore, he who had no sin was now made to have sin. That in him, you might become the righteousness of God. When we begin to speak words by faith, by his righteousness, then we can speak into that situation. Regardless of how imperfect we are, regardless of our struggles, you speak from a perfect place from a finished work cancer i curse you in the name of jesus not because of my ability to pray but because jesus our great high priest has finished the work hallelujah somebody the whole point of having christ's spirit in us is to have an intimate relationship with God, to know, to recognize His voice. This is the greatest inheritance, the greatest blessing. That's why you carry His name, little Christ. And part of the reason why we're not prospering is that we're boasting in the wrong things. We're boasting in, this, in the size of our trucks. We're boasting in the size of our, uh, of our accomplishments and our physical abilities and the basketball court. And you see, that's one thing I, I, don't, I hardly remember celebrities' names. Because when I, when I look at even one of my favorites, um, Stephen Curry, all I'm seeing is Christ at work. Thank God he gives him all the glory. Why should we be worshiping billionaires? God gave them that ability. And God has given you an ability. And when you begin to find your gift, you will begin to prosper. And if you knew what the psalmist said when he says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, I shall not decrease. I may be working two jobs right now, but I'm going somewhere. Oh, I'm growing from glory to glory. And as you come into that realization, you stop laboring and you walk into favor. Now, please hear what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not giving you permission to be lazy, but I'm saying it's time to activate your faith. I'm it's time for to you to start walking in heaven's culture and start prospering first by your great confession and not by how many jobs. How many jobs do I have apart from this job? Most, so many other people. So, okay, so, so, you, so you don't... So, I'm like, nope. It's the one thing God has called me to do. He will pay my rent. He will provide for me. I will give my wife the best. And I'll put my children in the best schools. Oh, come on. Come on. So I'm, I, God is good to me. You think we didn't have to take a step of faith to put our kids in school? When we saw homeschooling wasn't working <laughs> with our schedule? Let's, let's the Lord says, exercise your, and we began to speak it into being. And then when, we di when they did grant us favor and, 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 and expedite their um, admission, it was now, okay, how are we going to pay this school fees? I began to speak favor into that situation. The first day of work, the principal called Melody and said, hey, by the way, um, you want, you're only going to need to pay half the tuition. If you don't expect favor, you won't get favor. If you don't expect a positive outcome, you won't get a positive outcome. That's what Romans 8.28 is. It says, in all things, he's working out. Have you ever missed your way driving somewhere and your GPS did not recalibrate? And you finally got to that destination, like the first time I came to the United States? And I was asking, oh, where's this street? And my wife just told me, oh, just go to that one. And I went to, I had a two-hour drive because I went to, let's say, Green Street in another city. <laughs> and I learned how to use the GPS better. But, but the, the, the sum total of this whole story is that, yes, it took me two hours, but eventually it recalibrated. It recalibrated. I got to my destination. 
Can we have such childlike faith that regardless of how long it's taken, uh, for me and my house, uh, we shall serve the Lord. We're recalibrating. Hey, it's taken me a while <laughs> to buy my first car. <laughs> it's taken me a while to finally get that house, but I'm recalibrating. As I'm getting to know the Lord, I will get to my destination. And his destination says, I will prosper. Wow. So this is my take home. Knowing God is true prosperity. Jeremiah, 20, Jeremiah 9, 23, 24. This is what the Lord says. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom. Or the powerful boast in their power. Or the rich boast in their riches. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone. That they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth and that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. This is reiterating Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And it's righteousness. Somehow we missed that part. <laughs> and every other thing. Do you know that there's a law that says if you just seek to be good, seek to be nice. So I have a sermon on that. Just be nice. Because <laughs> sometimes it's hard to find some nice Christians. <laughs> just to, to reflect God's love. Goodness and mercy will follow you. Favor will follow you. It's somewhere in Proverbs, I think Proverbs 21, 21, I'm not 100% sure, but it says, uh, pursue righteousness and love and something, and you will find prosperity. I'm paraphrasing here. The number one reason some of us are, are, our confessions are ineffective is that we do not know God's will for our lives. So we are either over-confessing or under-confessing. Selfish ambition. The Bible says it in James 3.16. When it says, also in James, it says, we pray and we pray amiss because we pray for our own selfish. So we're over-confessing because we're calling for that new escalator. And the Lord says, no, this is, this, is, this is selfish. This is so they can go boast. This is so you can go show off. This is so you can go use it to, to chase ladies. Big church, big church. Why? See what I've achieved in one year. You know? What are we praying for? So God checks the motive. I think that's Proverbs 16. All man's ways seem pleasing to him, but God tests the motives of the heart. So sometimes we're over confessing and we're saying, God bless me. And God says, I've given you peace. Remember, peace means contentment. For years in Nigeria, this is big. Okay, all my Nigerian friends, especially those of you who are single. Beginning of the year, this is where the pastors like to catch them. By this time next year, you will be married. And then the whole church is shouting, Amen. You know what? Faith comes by here. And the Lord had told me, son, it's not your time. Is not your season. So I never confessed that. In fact, the one time where I thought, okay, this is my year. I started working as a youth pastor, left YWAM, and getting a bit of a good salary and everything. And, and I was praying. I just, God's word just bubbled up from inside of me. You may not see your spouse this year. That year, one of my mentors came. He was praying for me. He just held my hand. He just says, I just feel the Lord saying, you may not see your spouse this year. You know what? I said, God bless me with contentment. I waited three more years. And at the right time, it was the right time when God did speak to me. And God said, go. And I went and I found. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And I'm happy. <laughs> and I'm blessed. <laughs> Hallelujah. We are either over-confessing or under-confessing. Next week, I'm going to be talking about hindrances to prayer. I was supposed to be part of this teaching, but I knew that there was so much to say in this teaching. Last 
Friday, I put up a motivational moment. I encourage you to keep up with those. Proverbs 16, verse 3 was the key verse. It says, roll your works upon the Lord. Commit and trust them wholly to him. He will cause your thoughts to become agreeable to his will. And so shall your plans be established and succeed. We have the DNA of God. John 10, 3 tells us that his sheep recognize and follow his voice. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16 says, For who can know the thoughts, the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ in your spirit, and you need to make your soul subject to God's perfect mind in your spirit so that you can begin to know God's perfect will. That's what Romans 12, 2 is saying. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, chasing material things and doing things for the wrong reasons and motives. Do not conform to the lies and the wrong philosophies, but be renewed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know God's good, acceptable, and perfect will. It's his promise that as we just spend time in his word, the word will begin to work. You see, that word convert means to turn back to its original state. It also means to reverse. I believe whenever I'm in his word, God is reversing something and I'm slowly turning back to my Adamic nature because I have the new Adam inside of me that is slowly transforming me. <laughs> and we saw a glimpse of that in Luke 9. 29, when Jesus was praying, the Bible says his face altered and he transfigured. Prayer can transform your life. Hearing God's word can transform your life. You can hear a word that will quicken you, that will change your countenance. There's something about the presence of God and countenance. In fact, the word presence actually means face. My wife told me this yesterday that the, just pronouncing the word Yahweh causes your facial expressions Yahweh. There's something about his presence that is the fullness of joy. That even to pronounce his name. Where does prosperity start in your soul? As you begin to find this peace. As your countenance begins to change. The Spirit of God within you begins to transform you and you begin to sow, you begin to um, prosper even as thy soul prospers. That word, even as, it means according to. You will, you will prosper to the degree to which your soul has prospered. Come out of the way. That's why the Bible says, let us throw up all these weights, all these sins that easily beset us so that we can run this race with perseverance. You know, the life of God, one of them meaning for life, means run. There's just something about children that are filled with life. They're always running and knocking things down. Oh, may you begin to run and not go weary. May you begin to walk and not faint. So as I'm concluding here, faith, 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 faith. Hearing God's word through his written word, through his quickened word through prophecies. We don't stifle prophecies in this church. We don't play around with it. We believe in it through the gifts of the Spirit. We embrace it all. If it's in the Bible, we want it. <laughs> so rounding up here in Hebrews 4 verse 2, the Amplified Version, it says, For indeed we have had the glad tidings, gospel of God, proclaimed to us just as truly as they, the Israelites of old, did when the good news of deliverance from bondage came to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because it was not mixed with faith. With the leaning of the entire personality of God in absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom and goodness by those who hear it, who heard it, neither were they united in faith with the ones Joshua and Caleb who heard did believe. Next week, I'm going to be talking about hindrances to prayer. And I'll be expounding on some reasons, not all, why sometimes we confess 
and we don't get any results. One of them is that we don't mix it with faith. Heavenly Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for this opportunity to just speak your words of life that always bring light and understanding to the simple. Lord, we receive more revelation today. We receive more light. And we ask, O oh Lord, that your words will be made alive in us so that your words will begin to prosper in us so that it will become you willing to do and to it will be you who will be, be will to do it according to your good pleasure, Lord, as it says in Philippians 2, verse 13. I speak God's peace over us. May your peace May your shalom, may your healing bond continue to heal us of any brokenness, of any trauma, of any hurts, of any pain, so that our spirit can flow like a river into our soul, into our bodies, and bring forth that great blessing you have for us in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.